Alrighty, welcome back everyone. So today we finally start um, one of the most complicated of all the machine learning algorithms. Actually, it's not one of the most, it's, it's the most in my opinion, um, neural networks. So um, neural networks are astonishingly complicated. They are computationally expensive. Um, when I think of machine learning and why machine learning really didn't take off um, for a long time, um, I think one of the reasons is that neural networks were um, developed decades ago, uh, but there just wasn't enough computational power to be able to crunch through these, these algorithms. So um, they are incredibly difficult to describe at the beginning. Um, so to really go over what the algorithms are actually doing. Um, but luckily, there is a YouTube video that um, does an amazing job of kind of setting the stage for what they are and how they work. Um, so if you will, before you watch any of the rest of this video, uh, go to YouTube and watch um, a video by three blue one brown that's the channel uh, that you can see over in the or down there in the um, PowerPoint slide um, it's that's a wonderful channel tons of great videos for lots of things to do with mathematics and um, statistics things like that well actually lots of other topics too but um, they have the best introduction to machine learning, to uh, not machine learning, but neural networks that I've seen. So if you will go to the three blue, one brown channel, um, deep learning chapter one, but what is a neural network? Um, watch the first 13 minutes or so of it, because once you see the video, you'll understand why I say it's really difficult to get the complexity of neural networks across um, just by drawing by hand or making even uh, a pre-made slide. Um, this, the animations that are in the, the first 13 minutes are much better at conveying uh, how complicated these structures are. So if you will go ahead and watch the first 13 minutes, we'll pause right here and then we'll pick right up after that. So here, I'm gonna sit here and look silly and just smile for a little bit. Alrighty, hopefully you've had a chance to watch them, uh, to watch that first 13 minutes. Uh, we can now kind of move forward. So uh, I hope this goes smoothly. We'll, we'll see. We'll give it a try anyways. So uh, as you saw, um, neural networks consist of layers of many nodes that are connected uh, to each other and the complexity of the neural network is what allows it to uh, model systems uh, very effectively. But as you also saw, it there are literally millions of calculations that go on behind the scenes when it is trying to train the network. Um, it's This is why it didn't really... Um, explode until there was computational power ready for it. Um, the other algorithms, they showed their usefulness um, on a more limited scale, the ones that we've studied so far. Um, but neural networks languished. People said it was uh, worthless because it, it couldn't uh, effectively model a system. Uh, turns out you just needed enough computational power to really model the systems. And then suddenly, uh, neural networks are the go-to for many, 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 many uh, models and systems. Um, and the basic neural network has been transformed in uh, several different ways uh, to do everything from uh, incredibly accurate image recognition to um, be able to handle uh, artificial intelligence-ish um, games um, and one of my personal favorites uh, with 
sufficiently complicated neural networks, you can actually simulate creativity um, to where it is almost indistinguishable from the creativity that a person can impart. So this is why we are um, going to be tackling this concept because it is one of the foundational um, models that is used in machine learning. Uh, you can get away with, if you had to, not using logistic regression or any regression, um, and you would do just fine with neural networks handling everything. Turns out you don't want to for a lot of things just because they're, they are so computationally expensive. It's better to use other models, other algorithms, um, just because there's if you're doing something simple like sorting an email, whether it's spam or not spam, um, turns out logistic regression does just as, as well as a uh, neural network. But it's one of the beautiful things about neural networks is that they can do anything. You can just you throw enough computation at something and suddenly it, it works. So let's dig into the to the the heart of the neural networks and see what we have. So hopefully you're gonna enjoy this. It's one of my favorite parts um, of machine learning. So um, we're gonna have exactly the same hypothesis function as uh, logistic regression. So um, we're looking at uh, H of X being some theta transpose X which is going, we're going to say in the case of um, the neural networks, this theta transpose X is going to get replaced by just plain old Z. And then we're going to take that, send it into a sigmoid function, which is if I unpacked this right here, I would have one over one plus e to the negative theta transpose x. So this g of z right here is the sigmoid being fed in the z, which is the theta transpose x. That's exactly what we had as the logistic regression. Um, and we know what this does. It's going to um, map whatever uh, value that we get for theta transpose x into a value that lies between zero and one. So that still holds, uh, but the significant difference is what it will actually mean to the model. So these theta parameters that we have in our theta transpose X, um, they are not going to be the same uh, weights that we think of when we think of logistic regression. So logistic regression, the theta transpose, the thetas rather, um, those are the weights that would be applied to the um, expression in order to yield a good decision boundary between our two groups. So a, a line that cuts through the data in such a way that the data is accurately sorted between one group or another. That's not what the thetas are going to be doing in neural networks. The thetas in neural networks are going to be focused on um, how much impact a specific node within a layer has on the next layer. So you can kind of think of the theta parameters when we're talking about the neural networks is that, you know, they are going to have either a small impact or a large impact on the next layer. That's what the thetas are going to do. They're either going to make it have a very large impact for that node on the next layer nodes, or it can have a very small effect on the subsequent nodes in the next layer. So that's what your, your theta parameters are going to be doing. They're going to be setting the impact. Um, so, that's kind of a, a nice way to look at it, and it, it really works well with the mathematics, that the theta is the impact that one node has on the next layer. Okay? So uh, hopefully that's not too terribly bad. Um, so let's go to the next slide. 
Alrighty. So for this one, um, we're also going to be keeping the same convention that um, in our theta transpose x expansion, you know, where we have theta 0, x of 0, plus theta 1, x of 1, plus dot, dot, dot. That expansion, um, the uh, x naught is still going to be equal to 1. And what that does is it sets this theta 0 as a very special weight. That weight is going to be called the bias in the neural networks. Okay? So theta zero is going to be the bi the bias for a specific layer. Alrighty. Now the the bias is still going to act similarly to what it worked at before when before the theta zero was kind of like the baseline, right? It, it set the the level at which the model kind of began. Well, what, not the model began, but where the effects began. That's a better way of saying that. So what is the bias doing now? The bias now is going to act as kind of like a gatekeeper, a threshold as to whether or not a layer has a specific effect on the next layer. That's, that's kind of a broad way of thinking about what this bias is going to do, what the theta zero is going to do. It sets the threshold at which something happens from one layer to the next layer. Okay. And the other thing that is kind of different from what we've thought of things before is uh, we're going to be using the uh, sigmoid function uh, to map every single one of the um, the incoming values for every node into something that falls between a zero and a one. When the dust settles, we're going to have some, it's called an activation. And the activation is going to fall between zero and one because whatever led to the activation was fed into the sigmoid function. Okay? So, those are just a few of the ways that things are going to be different with neural network compared to the logistic regression or the, the linear regression. Um, neural networks have a bias that acts as a threshold for an effect occurring or not occurring. And each one of the nodes is the value that the node receives is determined by the previous nodes that are then fed through a sigmoid function and then that value between zero and one is called the activation. So each node is going to have a, a value that is called the activation for that node. Alrighty. So I think we've, we've got enough to kind of think about the basics now. Um, but since this is such a complicated structure, we're going to need some new notation to be able to talk about the, which node we're, we're referencing, which um, theta we're referencing. All of that has to be very precise. So um, let's go to the next slide. And let's talk about this notation. So uh, this notation, it's very foreign at the beginning, but you have to have it. You cannot reference things within a neural network without precise notation. So the first thing to talk about is um, what this means for uh, what each of the nodes, how we would reference each of the specific nodes themselves. So the actual nodes themselves. So uh, the values rather within the nodes themselves. So um, let me take this and clear what I have right here. Okay, there we go. So I'm just going to let me up the eraser size. I'm just going to clear this right here and draw a really quick network. And I mean super quick network. So we don't have to worry about spending a lot of time drawing lines. Alrighty. And maybe 
maybe it takes the same one right here. Alrighty, so I'm going to draw some arrows. This is going to be the rough network, and then I'm going to improve the rough network by drawing a detailed multi-layer network. All right, almost done. And really, when you draw all these, it's actually kind of, it's kind of elegant. I love all the little arrows, have the, the patterns that they form when they're fully connected, the layers are. All righty, so this right here, we're going to call this layer one. And typically, layer one consists of inputs. So um, x1, x2, x3, x4. This is going to be layer one. And it is going to consist of the inputs. Okay. This is going to be layer two. And this will be layer three. Okay. Now, A1, A2, A3, A4. So, the activation values are going to be denoted as something that looks like this. A sub 1 superscript J. Okay? That is the activation... of node one, that's the subscript, in layer J, okay? So, if I wanted to look at this node right here, this one would be, if I wanted to write it out, this would be node two in layer two. I wanted to represent this activation down here. That's supposed to be a four, by the way. This would be a sub so four in layer one. So that's how you would rep represent the activations. Now, typically the first layer is not referenced by an A, it's referenced by an X to stand for the inputs. Um, but you can still reference those as A's. That's totally fine. It's just most of the time the first layer is filled with X's instead of activations because they're not really an activation that was fed through a sigmoid function. They are the raw inputs into our neural network. Alrighty. Now, that's all well and good if we want to reference the activations, the nodes, the values on the nodes. That is not enough to be able to represent, for example, this value right here. What is this value? Well, this is going to be my theta. Okay? It's going to be a specific theta that goes from the fourth node, layer one, to the second node, layer two. Okay? So how do we reference that? Well, this is where it gets a little bit strange. It's theta sub, here we go. Start node, end node, and then starting layer. Okay, where each of these is a number. So it's not, they're not done in parentheses, I'm just trying to block them off where you can see. So for example, this one right here is going to be starting in node four, pointing to node two, starting layer one. 
So this is node 421. Starting node, ending node, starting layer. Okay? If I wanted to look at this one, let's go for this one right here. I wanted to reference this one. Okay. Well, that be well, that would be theta, starting node 2, ending node 3, 2, 3, starting layer 1. Notice that we do the starting layer and go backwards for the end starting node. The starting node is on the right. The ending node is on the left. That's exactly opposite how we normally read our subscripts. But uh, the reason for that is that it makes the linear algebra easier down the road to reference them backwards like this. Uh, we're going to do that code, but... Um, having coded one from scratch a neural network once and never ever want to do it again, um, this is much nicer to work with when you're doing the matrix multiplication um, aspects of a neural network. So that's how you reference the individual activations and the individual parameters, the, the weights, okay, the thetas. All righty. We're, we're almost there. We're going to, um, hopefully everything's going so good so far. We're going to end up with a um, detailed uh, diagram to show you exactly how this works for uh, two layers. Alrighty, so let me go to the next slide. Actually, I don't know, I, need to go, I just need to clear the space cloth cover that down there. Alrighty, so let me clear this. And we're going to make a large neural network from scratch. All right. We're going to have four nodes in our input layer. And we're going to have three nodes in the next layer. I'm trying to be pretty precise with this so that it looks good. All righty. So I'm going to label these x of 0, x of 1, x of 2, and x of 3. And right here, I'm actually going to use the activation. Um, <laughs> I just lost the word. The, the activation notation. Is, that's a, Say that three times fast. Activation notation. So here we go a sub 1 in layer 2, a sub 2 in layer 2, and a sub 3 in layer 2. Okay, so those are our activations, our uh, notation for that. Now I'm going to use different colors and make the network. So we're going to have it fully connected. All righty. Let's see. Now. Oh, you know what? I just realized something. I'm going to change something. I'm going to make this a little bit better. Bear with me. I am going to erase some of this. I want to change that. Oh, that's too small. There we go. I want to make it really nice. Let me go with that to that color. Do it this way. Yeah. That's going to make a nice, a very nice uh, model here. Okay, and then let me go to the next color. Let's see. Get some Christmas colors going. Oh, this is looking great. I am digging this. All right, and finally, let's 
Let's go for purple. Alrighty. Not bad at all. Okay. So, let's actually draw the thetas now, appropriately. So, the lines represent the connections from one node to the next node, but they are actually, when you think about it, in between those two nodes, there is a weight between them, a parameter. So these are actually the theta. So this is theta sub, well, what is it doing? It's going from zero to one and starting in layer one. Zero, one, starting in layer one. Okay, this one right here is going from one to one, starting in layer one, one to one, starting in layer one. This one right here goes from two to one. Oops, I'm not gonna be able to fit that in, am I? Let's actually erase that, get a smaller brush size. There we go. So this is going to be theta sub two to one. So two to one, starting in layer one. And then finally, this one right here is going to be theta three to one, starting in layer one. Okay. Now that we've got the green ones labeled appropriately, let's move to the red ones. So let me go to red. Alrighty, so this is going to be zero to two, starting in layer one. So zero to two, starting in layer one. This one right here is going to be one to two, node one to node two. So it's going to be one to two, layer one. This one right here is two to two. So this is going to be, I can fit it in here, two to two, layer one. That's where it starts. And finally, this one is going to be theta sub three to two, layer one, where we start. Okay, so now we have all of the thetas for the that feed into the first node and the second node. Now let's finish it off with the thetas that feed into the last node down here, a sub three. So we're going to have for the very first one, we we'll go from zero to three. That's a three, I promise. So theta sub zero to three starting in layer one. This one right here is going to be one to three. Theta sub one to three, starting in layer one. This one right here is going from node two to three. So two to three, starting in layer one. And finally, the last one, three to three. Theta sub three to three, layer one. All right. So we now have all of our um, inputs mapped over to the first, <laughs> to the second layer. Don't want to say the first. That is the first one right there. This is the second. Actually, let me write that down real quick. So this is layer one. And this is layer two. Okay, so now that we have that and all the thetas that map from the first layer to the second layer, let's actually show how we calculate these activations. Okay, so activation one in layer two, this value right here is given by G of G is the sigmoid. What gets fed into it? Well, 
we're going to have, this is green, so get to green, here we go. We're going to have theta 0, 1, 1 times x naught, so theta 0, 1, layer 1 times x naught plus the second one, so theta 1, 1 times x1, theta 1, 1 times x1 plus, now we're going to do this one, so theta 1, 2 times x2 and then plus the very last one, theta 1, 3 times x3. Whew, a lot. Alrighty, let me close that off with yellow. Alrighty. So that is how we get activation 1 in the second layer. We literally do theta transpose x, feed that into the sigmoid, and that's the value between 0 and 1 that gets stored in this activation. And then the same thing happens for the next node. So let's knock that one out. The second activation in the second layer is going to be G of... Alrighty, so now we're dealing with reds. So it's going to be the first one, which is theta 0, 2, layer 1, times x of 0, plus now this one, theta 1, 2, times x1, plus now this one, theta 2, 2, layer 1, times x of 2, and then plus this one, which is theta 3, 2, layer 1, times x of 3. All right. So that's how we get the second activation. Now let's do the very last one for completeness sake. Here we go. So we're going to have a sub 3 in the second layer. So the third activation. What do we feed into the sigmoid? Well, we feed in this first one. Theta sub 0 3 times x sub 0 plus theta, now this one, sub 1, 3, first layer, times x sub 1, plus theta, this one, sub 2, 3, layer 1, times x sub 2, plus the last one, theta, sub 3, 3, layer 1 times x sub 3. All right. That is exactly how we get all of these activations in the second layer. We do the theta transpose x. We feed it into the sigmoid. And whatever value that is between 0 and 1, that's what gets stored into these activations. Whew. I know that's a lot, right? All righty. So, um... If I wanted to, I could even make another activation. Let's just say that I was feeding in from this one to a new activation. We'll call this A sub 1, but it's in the third layer now. That's a 3. It's layer 3. Alrighty. What would it look like for this activation right here? Well, if I did this activation, let me do it blue. Yeah, there's a nice blue. Alrighty. This would be theta sub, let's see, we're going from node 2 to node 1, 2 to 1, starting in layer 2. That's that theta. And if I wanted this theta, it would be theta sub, I'm going from 3 to 1 now, starting in layer 2. And so you can see how it just marches forward. The notation is going to change, but it's exactly the same process every single time. Um, 
Now, this, I did neglect to say one thing, which I you probably picked up on right here, and that is these x of naughts that I've got right here. They are equal to what? Right? They're just ones. So that's a one, that's a one, and that's a one right there. All of these are ones. So really, the only thing that gets through for the very first bias is the theta parameter. That's why it's called the bias. It's the only thing that gets through. The x naught is a 1, so we only have to worry about whatever this theta is. And that is a threshold. So hopefully that goes well. All righty. I hope you enjoyed it. That is pretty much the basics of the notation that we're going to use for neural networks. The next lecture, we're actually going to be making some Boolean logic gates, which if you've never done that before, you're in for a treat. Boolean logic gates are a lot of fun using very simple neural networks. And once we do that, you're really going to get a feel for how the bias acts as this threshold mechanism. So anywho, I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you next video. Bye everyone.